Eber is driving from New Orleans to Homa. He's flying. He looks back and he sees, sure enough, the lights and he hears the sirens. He gets pulled over and the trooper says, uh, Sir, your name please? He said, Yeah, I'm Hebert. He said, Okay, let me ask you something. He said, You were going about 100 miles an hour. He said, the First, let me tell you, I've had a long day. I'm ready to go home. If you can give me a new excuse for going that fast, I'm going to let you go. He said, Let me tell you what happened. About three years ago, my wife ran off with the state trooper. I thought you was him trying to bring her back. <laughs> He let him go. <laughs> Thanks for asking the rest of the story, yes. We've been looking at the birth of Jesus, obviously in Bethlehem, and it's very important to clarify that Jesus' life did not begin at Bethlehem. He always was because he is eternal God. What happened at Bethlehem was that his deity was poured into a human being. So what we have in birth at Bethlehem is not the birth of God, God can't be born. We have the birth of the human being, Jesus of Nazareth. And probably everybody in Western culture knows not only that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but the elements. All the elements of the Christmas story. Every Christmas, I listen to Christmas music, and I'm always amazed when I hear people singing Christmas songs that I'm thinking, do they know what they're saying in the mall, I hear, joy to the world, the Lord is come. What do people think that means? In what way is he the Lord? Let earth receive her king? I hear people saying that. Actually, all you have to do to know the Christmas story, look at house decorations, Christmas cards, and above all, Christmas songs, and you'll know all the elements. The place. Old little town of Bethlehem. Jesus' bed. A way in a manger. No crib for a bed. Even the angels. Hark the herald angels sing. Or as I thought when I was a kid, hark herald, the angels are singing. <laughs> I thought herald was some kind of real plugged in guy there. <laughs> and anybody who's ever watched a Christmas pageant knows that Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. So just from songs, we know all those elements. I think my problem is this, though. All those famous elements of Christmas have become so familiar to us that we have lost the significance of those elements. Every one of the details at the little scene in Bethlehem has great significance spiritually to us. In fact, all those items are foreshadowing. Janine, I heard yesterday that that's the manger first king size bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> All the elements in the Christmas story are foreshadowings. For one, of Jesus' ministry, and what's the most critical part of Jesus' ministry? His cross. The cross. And as we saw last week, those elements of the Christmas story foreshadow the cross. Let's review where we picked up last week. Luke chapter 2 verse 1, now in those days, that means the days of the birth of John the Baptist, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, who reigned from 44 B.C. to 14 A.D., that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And Rome could do that because they had possession of all the inhabited earth. And the purpose for the census was for future taxing purposes. Luke, Mr. Luke, the precise historian, situates the time. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Syria ruled over the whole Middle East under the Roman system. And that brings it to about 4 B.C. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Every country that comprised the Roman Empire was free to designate their own system for who or who and where people would register. So in Judea, the system was that people would register at their ancestral homes. Now both Mary and Joseph were descendants of David. David's ancestral home was Bethlehem. Therefore, both Joseph and Mary have to go to Bethlehem. 
Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. We saw last week God used the decree of Caesar Augustus in order to bring Joseph and Mary, who lived in Nazareth, down to Bethlehem, so that Jesus could be born in Bethlehem to fulfill the scriptures. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now all those familiar elements all foreshadow something, and they all foreshadow his death. The clothes, the cloths he was wrapped in, the swaddling clothes, they're not little cute little blankets with bunnies on them. You remember where the clothes came from was that Mary brought her own grave clothes with her down for the trip in case she died during childbirth. So Jesus, at his birth, was wrapped in grave clothes, foreshadowing how he would end this, his physical life. And he's put in a manger. A manger was a feeding trough. And so there at the beginning, Jesus is associating himself with animals. Animals who were killed in the temple as, as a picture of the coming Messiah. Now, there is the ultimate Lamb of God identified with those animals. And when I say he was identifying himself with the animals, we have to understand that that little baby who was born did not know anything more than any other babies know. That little baby didn't know who he was. Right? We have to say that, otherwise he was cheating. We'll look at Philippians chapter 2 later today where it says that although he subsisted in the form of God, did not cling to that. What that means is, is that although he was fully God, not just equal with God, but fully God, in this lifetime, he did not use those divine prerogatives because that would have been cheating, wouldn't it? He came to identify with us. He had to be he had to identify with us to be our substitute on the cross. That means he did not cheat. So the little baby knew nothing. But what's amazing is that when we think about all these elements of the Christmas story, including fulfilling the prediction that he would be born in Bethlehem, who planned all those events? Who, pre- who pre-planned all the events of Jesus' life? And the answer is Jesus himself did. Isn't that amazing to think? It's not on your handout, but Micah chapter 5, verse 2, when it describes Jesus being born in Bethlehem, who wrote that verse? Jesus did. It's amazing. So everything that happened at his birth, although the little baby knew nothing, we see that it was Jesus pre-planning these things to show us things about himself. And mostly the foreshadowings of his death. He's in grave clothes. He's identifying with animals. And there was no room for them in the end. Now there were not ends of any kind like we have today. An inn was a place just where they had, it was a very, a very plain place with rooms, compartments. You brought your own bedding. You brought your own food. There was no shampoo, there was no conditioner, there weren't any mints. That was an inn. No continental breakfast? No continental breakfast. (laughs) Actually, occasionally, if you came in off the street and had nothing, they might give you some hay or straw. Now, all of those facilities were full because there was a massive crowd of people there to register for the census because so many people in Israel were descendants of David. So all those were full. People who knew people there would stay as guests in other homes. That was all full. There was another option. In Bethlehem, they would do this for Passover too. This was a unique thing, the census. But there were used to big crowds coming for Passover. Because Bethlehem is where they kept the lambs for the sacrifices in Jerusalem. It's just five miles south. In Bethlehem, they would just set out a field, an empty field. And that's where people would basically camp out when they were there for Passover or for an event like this. People just camp out in the open with whatever they had. They would normally do it in a place where there was a water well. That's where other people would stay. Now, old, old history tradition says that Jesus was born in a cave. And he probably was. And the explanation for that is that Many people, when they would come to Bethlehem, Jerusalem, say for Passover, 
they would take advantage of the fact that people who lived in that area had purchased caves to use as their graves. All right? So you have people in Jerusalem and Bethlehem who had purchased a cave to use as the grave. One famous example would be Joseph of Arimathea, who had purchased a cave in Jerusalem for his own burial. When these people would come from out of town, again, for example, at Passover, many times they would rent those caves for a few days days for their animals protection. So this would be a person, say, who had a little bit of money. They would have room at the inn, or they would have a private guest house to stay, and while they were staying, they would keep their animals safely in the cave. So there were, many of these caves had feeding troughs already in them. Well, you see, that's probably what happened. Joseph and Mary arrive, and their option is to go out in that big open area where everybody's camped out in the open, but they probably wanted a little bit of privacy before the childbirth. So it makes sense that they would have taken advantage of one of these caves that a wealthy person would have because there would have been a feeding trough in there. Now, if that is the case, how ironic. How ironic that he would have begun his life in a cave owned by a wealthy man and he would end his human life in a cave owned by a wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. All the elements at his birth point to his death. He was born to die, and remember, Jesus pre-planned it. Now, he came to die to provide forgiveness of sins for everybody who would believe. That's the only way to have forgiveness of sins. There's no other way. There's no plan B. The only way to be forgiven of sins is to believe in Jesus. And when I say that, I don't mean believe that he was, believe he was a good man. Just believe that when he died on the cross, he died for your sins. And I keep saying it that way because I don't want it complicated. It's as as simple as that. It's amazing. And it's always at Christmas. Another thing that amazes me, in addition to Christmas songs, how many times I hear people say, let's not forget the true meaning of Christmas. I want to say, what do you think that is? And I have asked people that, and they say, love one another, uh, peace, joy, and Hallmark cards, and divinity, and a lot of that's good, especially divinity. One of the amazing things about what we learn from the Bible is that all good people don't go to heaven. You ever thought about that? There are going to be a lot of people who have lived this life and were very good people, and they're in hell. There will be people who were good people, who went to church faithfully, who contributed money, and they'll be in hell. And there will be people who were jerks. You can be a jerk if at some point in your life you've trusted in Jesus and said, I believe he died for my sins. And those people go to heaven. And it's very important that we understand he died for my sins. And that's because he came to earth to identify with us. So you see, the reason I can say he died for my sins is that when he died on that cross, he took my place. I should have been there. He was my substitute. But he identified with me. And in the Christmas story, we see the astonishing degree to which he came down to our level to identify with us. It was not a light thing for Jesus to identify with us. It would be one thing for one of us to say, well, I'll take your place, I'll take your place. We're all equal. But Jesus came down to an astonishingly low level to identify with us. One of the great misconceptions that plagued the human race is this. And first let me say, I think the great misconception is mostly held by religious people. Is that people tend to think, well, I have to get better, I have to be better, to be acceptable to God. Now they're correct in a sense, God's up here, we're down here, but the initial misconception is people don't realize how big a gap that is. And so if you think, well I'm down here, God's up here, you think, well that's approachable. Right? I just do better. Now I won't get all the way up to Him, but I'll get pretty darn close, thank you very much. And God's pretty lucky to have me around. And uh, I'll go to heaven because I've closed the gap pretty well. 
misconception is that we raise ourselves to meet Him. And you know what? I believe most Christians think something similar. I believe most of us think something similar. We recognize although we've been saved, we're forgiven, we're going to heaven, God's up here, we're down here. And don't, isn't there some part of us that thinks, I'd better raise my performance up a little bit to get closer to Him. The Bible's very clear. We don't raise ourselves. We can't raise ourselves. The unbeliever can't raise himself, and I'm sorry to tell you, we believers, we can't raise ourselves. But the gap is closed by him coming down to us. He comes down to the unbeliever to meet him at the point of salvation and say, I've offered myself. I went to the cross for your sins. All you have to do is believe I did it. And for those of us who are already believers, wherever we are in our lives, he accommodates us now. And that's what I want to talk about today. And let's all think about that scene. Jesus at Bethlehem. It was not the quaint, cozy little picture that we see at nativity scenes, was it? With a nice little thatched roof. And Jesus in a warm little bed. It was not some idyllic scene. It was an ugly, smelly place where he was born. It would have been in a damp cave. And... It wouldn't have smelled good. It's not a pretty picture in any way. That was the world into which Jesus was born. Ugly, smelly. And you know why Jesus pre-planned that he would do that? Because that smelly, damp, dark world was a picture of the human race, of the human realm that he was about to enter. It's the realm of human flesh. So obviously Jesus pre-planned that he would be born in a realm of humanity that was going to be smelly and ugly and dirty. And that foreshadowed his whole life. He hung around with people. We would have been scandalized. I believe most people in church would have been scandalized seeing Jesus interacting with people. We would have been stunned. He was not ashamed to identify with that realm. And you see, he... uh, He willingly chose that. And think about that little baby with those clothes wrapped in those cloths. Those odors, he would have absorbed those odors. He would have gotten dirty himself. So it's not just that he was willing to interact in that realm, to enter the realm of ugly humanity. He got dirty himself with everybody else and everything else. Romans 8.3, Paul says that God the Father sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Paul crafts that very carefully. It's extremely carefully worded. In the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus did not have sinful flesh. He did not sin. He did not have a sin nature. That's why he was born of a virgin. Because Romans chapter 5 says that the sin nature is passed down through human fathers. He did not have a human father. He had no sin nature. So he, that's why he didn't sin. But he was created in the likeness of sinful flesh. And that means a lot. Let me begin by saying, first thing it means is that he looked like everybody else. He smelled like everybody else. If you saw him, you wouldn't have noticed him. He didn't have a big pink heart flashing in his chest. He didn't have a halo. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh. And again, what does that mean? He didn't mind interacting with everybody else. Although he didn't have a sin nature, he had no problem interacting with people who did. He did not inherit a sin nature. However, Paul does say the likeness of sinful flesh. And he's making a very important point. Jesus did not inherit a sin nature. However... Jesus did inherit the physical fallen nature which comes from sin. Does that make sense? He did not inherit the spiritual sin nature, but he inherited the physical fallen nature which is a result of sin. Humanity has fallen because of sin. He took on that same fallenness that sin produces, although it was not his sin that produced it. You see, when Adam sinned, there were consequences that were spiritual and physical. When Adam sinned, there were spiritual consequences. 
He lost his relationship with God. He was restored. But human race, descended from him, was born alienated from God and with a sin nature which was passed on through fathers. In the physical realm, when Adam fell, there were consequences. One, people became mortal. And you know, if you think about it, it may be astonishing to realize that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was a mortal human being. And if he had not died at the cross, he would have died of some disease or of old age like everybody else. He was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. So in the physical realm, Adam's sin made people mortal and Jesus inherited that mortality. And Adam's fall produced physical weakness and Jesus took that on too likeness of sinful flesh. Philippians 2, 6-7 through 7 pretty much clears it up. Although he existed in the form of God, that's not a very good translation at all. In fact, it's very bad because Jesus does not exist, does he? People say God does not exist. Do you remember? They're, they're correct. You know that? People say God does not exist. They're correct. Because exist means to have being out of something else. We all exist. Because our being is derived from His. X means out of. That's how to remember that. So we live out of His life. God does not exist. That would mean His life came from somebody else. He subsists. His being is totally self-derived and eternal. So it says, in fact the word is that, although He subsisted, that was the word from the Greek philosophers that Paul used, although He subsisted in the form of God. Why did Jesus subsist in the form of God? Because He is God. Now here's a verse that people really get confused. It says, He did not regard equality with, th- with God a thing to be grasped. Again, that's very bad wording because it gives the implication that he did not have equality with God and he wished he could grasp it. Isn't that what it seems like? What it says is he did not regard, and first let me say there's a word we need to add here, a very important word that's in, and when I'm saying I'm adding it, it's in the text. And this the word his before the word equality. I shouldn't have left that one out. He did not regard his equality with God a thing to be, and then it says, a thing to cling to. If there is something you grasp, it means you don't have it and you want it. If you're clinging to something, it means you do have it, right? So what it's saying is that although he subsisted eternally, being eternal God, he did not regard that his equality with God, which he had, as something that he had to cling to. Meaning, although he is fully God, he was always God, he will always be God. For those 30 years lived on earth, he did not cling to his divine prerogatives. But he emptied himself. Now, he did not empty himself of his divinity. He emptied himself of his divine prerogatives. Here's another way to look at it. He did not empty himself of his deity. He emptied himself of his attributes. He didn't use them. It's interesting. As we continue on the life of Jesus, there will be many occasions where we think, well, he used his omniscience. He used his omnipotence. No, he didn't. He never did. That would have been cheating. Remember? He came to identify with us. He didn't use them. So that means... Although he was, was, is fully God, he pre-planned, when I go to earth, I'm going to be born in a low setting. I'm going to show that I'll identify with everybody. I won't cheat. I won't use my divine prerogatives. So he lived his life as a human being with the same fallen physical nature as us. The likeness of sinful flesh. Now let's think more about this. And before you start sending the hate email, listen to me. Follow this. This will sound astonishing. But let's just think this through. Don't we all agree that Jesus was born with a fallen body? Wouldn't we agree that part of the body includes the brain? Well, that means that Jesus was born with a fallen brain. 
You ever thought about that? I think sometimes we think that Jesus went through life with superhuman intelligence. He didn't. You see, Jesus was not any smarter. He did not have any more intelligence than we do. He had the same mental limitations in his life as as we have. Isn't that amazing? As he approached problems and difficulties, he didn't have more brain power to bring to that situation than we do. He's more in the likeness of sinful flesh. So as we face issues in our lives, and many of those issues, as we face them, which compounded by the fact that we don't know what to do, we're mentally inadequate to face them, he had the same problems. Born in the likeness of sinful flesh. So when we have those issues in our life and we think, I'm unable to do that. I'm unable to understand it. I'm not able to assimilate it. What's happening doesn't make sense. Jesus had the same issue. And again, as we trace his life, we're going to find some remarkable things that happened in his mind when he could not understand something. Isn't that amazing? He didn't understand. There were times in his life he read scripture and didn't understand them. There were things that happened around him, he didn't understand them. His brain was fallen, just like ours was. So when when the Bible reiterates that he identified with us, he was in our likeness, he means it. Psalm 103, 14, Psalm of David says, For he himself knows our frame. Actually, the word frame means he knows how we were shaped. How were we shaped? We were shaped with a fallen nature. Now, it's interesting the word knows. The word knows is a word that means to know from personal experience. So what's he saying? He, Jesus, he's personally aware of our fallen nature because he had one too. And then it says he is mindful that we are but dust. Let me make a very important clarification of the word. I think it's fascinating. It doesn't say he is mindful. It says he remembers that we are dust. Why does he remember that we are dust? Because so was he. Wherever we are, he was there too with the same limitations. So physical, mental limitations that plague us, he had the same. So think about this. Remember we say, Lord, I don't feel adequate to do this. I don't understand this. I got these issues. I'm I'm not adequate to do them. You know what Jesus says? I know. I remember. We have a saying, colloquial saying today, been there, done that. That's him. Wherever we're facing, he's been there, done that, and with the same limitations as we have. That's what we, that's what I'm having a hard time shaking to tell you the truth. I keep thinking, yes, he had problems. Yeah, definitely, he had issues. But I keep thinking he had more mental power to bear in that situation than I do. And the fact is, he did not. And that explains why he said, as a verse we've seen many times, John 8, 28, Jesus said, I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. And that's a lesson Jesus had to learn. And now, why did he do nothing on his own initiative? Because he had learned he did not have the mental ability to do it. If he had had superhuman intelligence, he would not have had to rely on his father for every single thing, would he? But he had the same limitations we do physically and mentally. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. And again, I'm... But I hope I'm not being nitpicky, but the word sympathize is not a good word. That's not what it says. And it's very sad. We have a perfectly good English word to translate the exact Greek word, and it's empathize. Now, there's a big difference between sympathizing and empathizing. What they have in common is that they're hard to say. But the difference is, obviously, you sympathize with someone when you look at someone in a bad situation. You empathize with someone when you look at someone and you're there too. And that's how our high priest Jesus empathizes with our weaknesses because those weaknesses he's referring to are our physical and mental inadequacies. He empathizes with us because he was there. We don't have one like that. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, another verse has been terribly misused. The word tempted is not a good translation. 
Because you see, when we talk about Jesus, talk about Jesus being tempted, we ought to say the word is tested. Because when we say the word tempt, when we say I was tempted to do that, we don't just mean we were provided the opportunity, do we? Don't we mean more than that? I was tempted to do that. That means more than someone presented me the opportunity. It means we felt an inclination to, right? We felt a desire to. That's what we mean by I was tempted to. That's not what this means. He didn't have the temptation to sin in that sense. He didn't feel the inclination to sin because he did not have a sin nature. However, although he was not tempted to sin, he was certainly tested, and it says, in all areas. You know what all areas mean? It means all areas. Physical, mental, emotional, whatever struggles we deal with, he had to do the same. And remember, let me say again, not only did he have to deal with the same physical, mental, emotional issues as we do, he had to deal with them with the same lack of resources to deal with them as we do. And there's an obvious application, and it's given in the next verse. If we understand all that, how he totally identifies with us, there's an obvious application, Hebrews 4.16, therefore, and let me pause, I'm sorry, and just point something out. Many times I say, whenever we see therefore, we ask, what is it therefore? And actually, you know, that's a great exercise. You'd be amazed, you'd be amazed how much you'd learn. Go to concordance and just write down all the verses where you see the word therefore. Write them down on a piece of paper. Then go back through, you'll notice something. The therefores are a hinge. The hinge between here's a fact and therefore there's an application. Well, in this case, that's what we would expect. We would expect to see a fact and then therefore and then the application. It's exactly what we find. Hebrews 16, therefore, let us draw near with confidence. Actually, it says with boldness. To the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Notice, he's saying that we go boldly to the throne of God. And by the way, we do. And again, I've heard people say, you mean to tell me we just barge right into the throne room of God? And I would say, yes, we just barge right into the throne room of God. Yes, that's exactly what we do. But we don't want to miss why we can do that. Therefore, let's point back. Let's go back to the previous verse. The reason we can go boldly into the throne is that the person who is sitting on that throne is a person who is still a human being. You ever thought about that? The reason we barge into the throne is that the person who is seated on the throne is a human being and that human being remembers what it was like to deal with this fallen world with a fallen physical and mental nature. He doesn't lord it over us. Although he is our Lord, he doesn't lord it over us. He's a human being as we are, so when we go in there, we get a warm reception. He totally identified with us. I believe too often when we feel inadequate, whenever we feel that we have issues we can't deal with, I think we start feeling ashamed. We start feeling embarrassed. We feel inadequate, and we have to say, well, I'm sorry, I can't deal with those things. I think sometimes we get an apologetic nature towards God. We confuse confession with apologies. We feel like we did something wrong when we didn't. If we encounter situations, we can't assimilate it, we can't understand it, we don't have superhuman brains, we need to remember, he says, I know, I remember. So he doesn't say, I forgive you. He says, I know. Tell me about it. He knows. He says, I remember. Me too. And what does he say? He says, I couldn't either. I couldn't do that either. I was exactly the same. So what did he learn though? He learned to rely on his father. What do we do? We rely on him. And that means we go to him. And that's what Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 is saying. He's saying you have a high priest who's been there, done that. Therefore, there's no reason whatsoever for you to not go to him. He won't judge you. He won't condemn you. And in fact, if we understand that, that he's lived with the same physical and mental limitations as we did, we will understand how he does see sin in our lives. You see, Jesus does not see our sin as something to condemn us. How did Jesus see the sin 
that impacted him. Notice how I worded that? He did not have sin. But don't we all agree that sin of others certainly impacted him? It gave him a physical fallen nature. It sent him to the cross. Yes, so sin definitely impacted Jesus. Sin was a burden that Jesus had to carry, wasn't it? Again, not, our, not his sins. It was our sins. But you also remember he totally identified with us. So that means that when he took our sins upon him, he accepted them as his own. He took ownership of them. And that's very important because that means we don't own them anymore. He literally took them. So how did Jesus see sin as it related to him? As a burden. So how do you think Jesus sees our sin? As something to condemn us? No. He sees our sin as something that burdens us down. That causes us grief. That's how he sees it. And that's why in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, that means burdened down, and I will give you rest. I think we think that he's saying, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will make it worse by punishing you. And somehow you'll get rest, I guess, <laughs> after the discipline. How else could he have said it? It's sin that makes us weary and heavy laden. It's our sin, our fallen nature that causes burden. He says, come to me. Don't be afraid. Why does he don't be afraid? He says, because I had the same burden. And I'll give you rest. And the reason he'll give us rest is that he learned something in his life. He learned that when he went to his father and said, I can't deal with this, his father took the load. You know what lesson he wants us to learn? Jesus would say to us, you do to me what I did to my Father. Take my yoke upon you and you will learn. It says you will learn from me. It says you will learn of me. You will learn about me. That's what he wants us to learn. What kind of person he is. He's a person who's lived where we lived. Who doesn't judge us. I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, see all those elements of Christmas foreshadow his ministry, his death on the cross, and how he intended to relate to people like us who are sinners. But there was no room for them in the end, and that's another foreshadowing. Because although Jesus astonishingly came and said, I'll identify with you no matter how low you are. If you believe in me, I'll forgive your sins no matter how bad they are and I'll give you eternal life. You just trust in me. It's all you have to do. Astonishingly, most, for most people, there's no room in the end. Most people don't have room for that. Most people don't accept it. John 1.11, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. His own specifically would be the nation of Israel. However, in a broader sense, his own would be everybody. Because he, he's the creator. He came to his own people, human race, but those who were, own, who were his own did not receive him. Most people are like the people there in Bethlehem, oblivious. How ironic. How ironic this is. That there were shepherds in a nearby field. And that field where those shepherds were in Bethlehem was the field where the sheep were raised that were going to be used to sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. And how ironic that all those little lambs were up there about to be slaughtered and the ultimate lamb of God, the real lamb of God, is in an obscure cave in Bethlehem and the world is oblivious that the Savior has been born. It's absolutely astonishing. But that's foreshadowing too. Because most people are oblivious and indifferent. But very few will receive him. And that was foreshadowed too. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. He's saying most people don't accept, but some do. And who are those? The ones who believe in his name. And his name does not mean Jesus. His name means the Savior. So when someone says, I believe in Jesus, the question is, do you believe in Jesus as the Savior? Most don't, a few do. And now we have that foreshadowed. Because now we have a picture of a few people who accepted Jesus. 
Luke 2.8, in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Again, those are the sheep that are about to be sacrificed. And by the way, this is how we know it. We probably know it was not December 25th when Jesus was born because they did not keep their flocks out at night in the winter. It's probably spring. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly they appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among men. <laughs> it says, with whom he is pleased. I've seen, I've seen it translated, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. None of those make any sense, and that's not what it says. It says, peace on earth to men of goodwill. And actually, I need to clarify that. Goodwill does not mean people who have good intentions, people who are well disposed, people who are good people. That's not what it means by people of good will. It literally means good will. What does the will mean? The will means your decisions, right? The will is our, deci- is our decision-making authority. The free will people have to make decisions. So he's saying that people who make the correct decision will have peace. What's the correct decision? To trust in Jesus as Savior. He says, for those people, there will be peace. And that means peace between us and God and peace during this time we live of fallen bodies, fallen human nature. How would you, how would you trans- and peace on earth. Well, literally, literally what it says is, peace on earth to men of good will. That's literally what it says. I would paraphrase it and say, peace on earth to those who make the correct decision. That would kind of be my amplified. You said you don't necessarily think that he was born in December, that it could have been in the spring. Well, when did they do the census? Is there any record of the census? It's not known exactly. That's why it's, and that's why we can narrow it down from the fall of 5 B.C. to the spring of 4 B.C. Pretty much had to be in that, in that time frame. That's all we know. Now, the people at that time would have known exactly when it was. We just lost the records. So the shepherds get the word from the angels. Luke 2.15, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. I want to point out the word the shepherds begin saying to one another. It's a tense that implies urgency. And basically it says they kept urgently saying to one another. They're in a heightened emotional state. The English translation is kind of watered down and we miss some of their, they're keyed up emotionally. Can you imagine an angel appears to you, you're scared to death. Then he starts talking, he says don't be afraid, the Savior's born. You're not going to say, oh dear. I feel we should go to the city now, as it were, and investigate the matter. They're not going to talk like that. They're they're all keyed up. So they begin urging, let's go, let's go now, let's see what's happening here. So they came in a hurry, and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. Actually, I want to point out this verb tense. They came in a hurry. This is what's called a, a compound verb, and here's what it's saying. It's also implying frantic urgency. So the picture is they're going door to door in Bethlehem. Can you imagine? How many people thought they were crazy? Doc, doc, hello. Who is it? Yeah, we're looking for a baby in a feeding trough. Uh, No, thank you. We gave it the office. Can you imagine? They're going door to door looking like crazy people. They probably got wild eyes looking in their face. They're saying, we're looking for a baby. He's wrapped in grave clothes, and he's laying in a feeding trough somewhere. Where is he? Oh, they were desperate, and they finally found him. And we don't want to miss this sequence. They were told about Jesus. They went to him and they found him. See that? They were told about Jesus. They went and they found him. Now what are the odds they find that baby in Bethlehem? 
Do you realize there were probably 25, 30,000 people in Bethlehem at this time? And most of them not in houses, they're out in the field. But they found him. We don't want to miss that sequence because that's a pattern. The pattern is anybody who wants to be saved, God will lead them to Jesus no matter where they are. That means anybody who at at the throne of judgment, anybody who goes to hell, it's because they didn't want to be saved. So Luke 2.17, they made the statement. that When they had seen this, they made known the statement. They had been told about the child. They said, yeah, we know. These angels told us. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. Now, notice two different responses. The shepherds go telling everybody, but not Mary. Luke 2.19, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And again, the verb tense is a highly intensive personal verb that means she treasured, she pondered them, and she kept keeping these things in her heart. She was keeping a scrapbook in her soul about her son. And bless her heart, she's going to have moments of great joy and pain pop like no other mother ever has had. But the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as had been told to them. There's the pattern. They're told about Jesus, the Savior, but you see, they had to respond, didn't they? What good would it have done if they had been told about the birth of the Savior and they had never left that mountain? Nothing. They had to communicate with Jesus. They had to identify with Him, and that's the pattern. Again, people listening, I've told you about Jesus. If you don't respond, you're not going to be saved. I'm And fortunately, the only way to respond is not to turn over your life, not to rededicate your life, not to turn over, not to turn over a new leaf, not to have a self-improvement program. Just right now, believe Jesus died for your sins. Isn't that amazing? Someone can be a reprobate his whole life, and in fact, on his deathbed, he can say, "I believe Jesus died for my sins." And where does he go? He goes to heaven. And for those of us who are already believers, remember the lesson. All these elements that we see in the Christmas story point to the astonishing degree to which he came to identify with us. We don't try to raise ourselves up to him wherever we are in our Christian life. Ask him to come down to us. That's his system. Next week we'll move on past that. Anybody have any questions about this birth scenario? Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you not only for his birth in Bethlehem, but that astonishingly, he as fully God, not only did the predictions, but pre-planned every element of his life. Not just to conform to scripture and to fulfill all the prophecies, although they did, but above all, Jesus pre-planned his life to give us pictures of the astonishing degree to which he would identify with us. That he was born in the likeness of our sinful flesh. Although he did not have sin, he suffered the same burdens from sin. Mental limitations, physical limitations. Wherever we've been, he's been there. Therefore, Father, would you teach us to learn the lesson he learned from his childhood. That we don't depend on ourselves or our own mental, physical abilities for anything. We totally rely on him. We thank you for Jesus and we thank you in his name this morning. Amen.